the turnaround time on the book was three months, and there was no possible way I could do that on my own. And I said, is it okay if I ask someone to write it with me? Somebody who knows horror, someone named Simon Abrams. He wasn't and available. He so wasn't available. <laughs> yes, so this is actually your uh, non-union equivalent. I'm the stunt double, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, uh, we split it up, and I did uh, the, the bulk of the, uh, the... I did the main interview that threads through the book with, with Guillermo, and an interview with the cinematographer, and Simon did uh, all of the sidebars, which was how many total did it end up being? 10 or 12, something like that. Yeah, yeah. and then we spent several days, I don't remember how many, like editing the manuscript down to make it comprehensible. Oh. And uh, that was, um, you know, te just tedious, tedious work. You yeah, know? but I, one of the things that that process made me realize is... Uh, there's just so much, so many just passes that you have to do to make sure that everything is letter perfect. Yeah. And uh, it's just something that I've worked on with you on a couple of your books in terms of doing photo captions and footnotes and things like that. But this was kind of a whole other ball game in terms of, you know, just, you know, is this exactly what he said? Is that what the, the footnote is? That, is, that, is that the exact quote? Is that the date? And uh, it was tedious no sorry <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. well yeah that's the hard part and it's also organizationally you can be you know I talked to I, I interviewed Guillermo over the course of three days and we would talk about maybe we talked about the cinematography four different times but you can't do that in a book where you talk about the cinematography four different times you have to put it in one section that's about the cinematography and and also try to make it seamless and not falsify it um, and uh, and also uh, Guillermo has a way of speaking that is very, shall we say, colorful. Like, sometimes you know what he means when he's sitting right in front of you, but if you see it on the page, it doesn't make any sense at all. So in that case, we had to find a way to explain it or have Guillermo explain it and not completely destroy what was charming about it. Um, that's exactly, I mean, that's, because anytime you do an interview, I find you have to do that because it's not just, um, it's sort of similar to the interviews I've done with for the Village Voice and for Vanity Fair. Any any publication that has not just your managing editor, but the copy editor and even a managing editor above them, you have to go through this process of first you condense for clarity because, for example, a reader is not going to understand uh, master shot um, technical jargon. Basically, right. you have to first you have to do it for accessibility and for for word count, and then you have to to make sure that you're making it so that your subject can read back their words and recognize, no, oh, that's me, and, and do it in such a way that it's not just, you know, you, you reflect their voice in that sense. And that was tricky because we have so many people in the book, mm -hmm. as you said, and for redundancy's sake, we had the need to sort of um, make it as enjoyable as possible without, you know, without repeating ourselves, but also in terms of making it so that your eyes don't glaze over because it's just question, answer, question, answer. Oh, new, different question, answer, question. So like, for example, the sidebars, I thought that the best way to do that was to take out all of my questions and to just make them kind of each one just the, the subject. So you'd get like my introduction and then the rest of it is just like almost like a statement. It's like a studs turkle kind of thing. That's more generous than I think of, but it's it's like well, in the sense it'll be like you know an interview with so and so who's been who was a machinist from 1952 to 1974, yeah. and then there's a chunk of they're telling their story, but Stud Sturkel is not in there. So, no, he's not in there. But yeah, that's right. That's exactly it. It's it's a matter of basically making it so that you can you can get a sense of where this person's coming from. We chose the best bits in these sidebar interviews, and we tried to make it so that it was almost like having someone talk to you. Like if you were to go to like, I don't know, like Colonial Williamsburg or a museum, and they, they like a, an actor would come out and tell you like, well, this is what this is, this period of, of our lives were like, and then they'll go back, and then- they'll, And they, then they would hand you a coupon <laughs> for ye old turkey leg. <laughs> that's, that's it, yeah, that's- <laughs> We should have. We this should have handed those out. We should hand those out here. Who do you want? We'll, we'll give you the drumstick coupons. We, we will. I, I just meet us after, and we'll we'll do it. But yeah, it's 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 it is like that because it's 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 sort of we wanted it so that anytime we worked those uh, the sidebars in, so that anytime Guillermo was talking about, for example, 
the costumes or the storyboards or the uh, the different aspects. It's sort of like in in Starship Troopers where it's like, do you, would you like to know more? And then yeah, you have right. that little pop up of yeah. the sidebars, and uh, that way you get the sense that um, there's a bit of interactivity as uh, as we were talking. You have a, a bit of of, of um, variation, I guess. Yeah, actually, in the um one of the other film books I did was I did a standalone book about the Wes Anderson uh, film Grand Budapest Hotel, which was sort of, you know, came in handy because this is very similar, although it looks different. It's got some of the same ideas behind it. But um, also in arranging the material in the book, you have to be thinking about where things fall on the page. And, you know, I was asking, I always have to ask questions like, how big are these pages and how many words fit on a page and how many, how many, how much of this page is available for words and how much do you want to save for pictures? And that way we can determine like how long an interview should last and where we have to cut it off. And also creating little things like, you know, Guillermo starts talking about the cinematography and then you turn the page and lo and behold, there's a two page spread where the cinematographer is speaking. And then you turn that page and we're back to Guillermo. So it's sort of like a documentary, like a movie, like a, a documentary you'd see, you know, in the theater or on Netflix, except it's on the page. You know, you're thinking about when do we cut to this? When do we cut back to this other thing? No, that's that's very true because the the thing is, I think that style really suited this particular project because a lot of what you and Guillermo talked about was this idea of how all the disciplines and all of the contributions of the different artists are combined. He had this amazing concept that he talks about in the book about how cinematography when you talk about cinematography of a film it's you're talking about the way that the the guy who works with the camera is interacting with the costumers the set designers the actors the, the people who light it it's an interdisciplinary thing so cinematography is a little bit of everything and it requires cooperation and collaboration from people from any uh from, from the director to the the smallest actor and mm -hmm. it's i think that really was for me a big through line in this book so being able to have um you and guillermo guide us through that and then to be able to have those little discursive moments and tangents i thought that was uh what probably a, a, a really reflective of, of this particular project one of my one of my regrets is that we weren't able to put when I interviewed him, when we were talking about cinematography and he was talking about the idea that everything, kind of everything is everything. Like a lot of times people compliment the cinematography, but they're not just complimenting the way that something was photographed. They're complimenting the colors that the production designer chose for the set, the colors that the costumer chose for the costumes, the makeup, the hair on the actors, and all of these things are sort of working in, in concert. And um, as an example, he took my notebook and I still have this drawing somewhere, but he took the notebook and he drew a woman in a dress, like an 18th century dress, like kind of poofy, standing in a doorway. And it was a wide shot. And he said, so in the wide shot, you could be complimenting the cinematography, but you'd also be complimenting the set design. But if you did a close up, and then he drew the same thing from a close up where it was just her face and her shoulders and her neck. And he said, the architecture becomes the dress, the, the hair, and the makeup. That's the, art, that's the production design in this scene, is whatever this actress happens to be wearing, which is pretty mind-blowing. But he's, he's, he's like that. And he actually, you know, if he wasn't as a successful, you know, an internationally successful filmmaker, I could, I could definitely see how he could uh, have become a teacher. You know, like he could have become a film professor or something like that. Yeah, I, I like the way that in any of these conversations, um, some of the details and the specific imagery he uses, I think about them still, like particularly how uh, the composition of certain shots, they bring to mind other films. For example, we specifically point out a couple of influences like Luce Manuel's uh, Los Olidados, uh, shots from Mario Bava's Kill Baby Kill, uh, Virgil, John, uh, John Ford's The Searchers, that last shot in the, the arch, yeah. and, uh, I guess the sense is we've tried very much to give you in some way the sense of what it's like to be working on this and to be living with this film to the point where you won't even necessarily be thinking about it and then suddenly you'll be like, that's just like the that's that part in the film. And like I catch myself thinking that. Like I remember I was reading about Mario Bava and I saw this shot uh, from Kill Baby Kill and there's like just a shot of 
a, a little girl in a, in a window, and it's exactly what Guillermo used in Devil's Backbone. I even you can compare some of these photos, and they are he clearly had it on the brain, and it's almost like you're inhabiting the same space for a little bit as the, as this guy. And I think you you capture that really well. You well get to in you get to kind of walk in. You get to kind of walk into the artist into the artist's mind and spelunk and sort of turn things over, which is a lot of fun. But it's also, you know, another thing is there's always a sense of, of um, frustration and regret for me when I actually finish a book because I immediately start thinking about all the things I could have said that I didn't say. And the more you watch something, the more things you discover. And in fact, and it's funny because this was, this was your first time experiencing this, and, but this is not my first time at the rodeo. And I was kind of laughing seeing, seeing Simon go through the stuff that I went through the first time I did a film book like this, which is, you know, we've got two or three days to go before we have to turn in the manuscript. And Simon is continuing to discover new things about the movie. And he was like, how are we going to put this in? Where are we going to put that? And it's like at a certain point, it's like, you got to just let it go, man. Yeah. But you never do let it go. And in fact, I was reading, uh, the, I wrote a book about Mad Men a few years ago, and it just came out in paperback. And they sent me the paperback, and I'm sitting there reading the paperback, and I'm going, God, you only, you only noticed about half the stuff you should have noticed in this one. What, you know, what's wrong with you? And that's because I've watched that particular episode two or three more times since the book came out. But it does beg the question of, like, is it possible to live in a single work of art indefinitely, for the rest of your life and never need anything else. And I think maybe it is if it's really a good piece. This it's it's that's a question that's I think worthy of for this film in particular because the movie's about a ghost that doesn't disappear at film's end. It's about a story about remaining and the pain of remaining and how things don't resolve the way they should and a refusal of closure. So it's it's not good, it's not bad, it's just you live with it, and uh, yeah. I think that's one of the things that makes it such an atypical horror film. I'm haunted by the ghosts of all the rewrites I didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, yes. That's I, I can I can sense that. <laughs> so does anybody anybody want to ask any questions? It could be about Guillermo. It could be about the book. It could be about like what we're wearing. You know, it's not Versace. So wait, it isn't. All right, thanks. <laughs> he keeps give randomly, me, randomly flipping stuff. through the book. I'll find something. <laughs> what about, puts finger on word. <laughs> yes. Um, did you consciously try to make a book that, um, that honored the structure of the movie? Because the book is, I mean, it's a cocktail book, but it's, you know, it's labyrinthian. There's like, there's, um, it's a very uh, complicated, creative book, the same way the movie is. I wonder if you specifically tried to make a book that are the movie as structure. Well, I'll say that, you know, unlike most of the film books I work on, I didn't, uh, I was not like driving the, driving the ship, but the design of this. This is something like, this guy, uh, Chris Prince, who works at Insight Editions, is, is you know, he, he was like doing most of the design on this thing. Like we were thinking about what needs to be on the page, but we weren't choosing it. With certain exceptions, like some of the shots from other movies, we were saying, you got to have this on this page. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also um, there were cases where like when we looked through the book, we realized that there were too many images that were kind of similar and, they, and some of them needed to be taken out and replaced with other things. But... As far as the look of it goes, like this is this is kind of different than most of the other books that I've worked on because there's things in the book. There's like actual stuff in the book that there's like drawings and sketches and and uh, uh, blueprints and things that are physically stuck into the book that you can sort of unfold and look at, which I don't understand how they were able to do that and still have the book be affordable because um, I wanted to do that in some of my other books and I was told you can't. The book would cost $100 if you did that, so we didn't do it. But somehow they know how. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I like about this book is the idea of, in terms of structure, we did get to, to choose certain things. Like, for example, the uh, comic book artist, Carlos Jimenez, uh, he is also a storyboard artist. He had a big influence on the film. Um, I got to choose which pages would be representative, like trying to imagine what the first impression of this artist is going to be for someone who's just thumbing through the book. Like how, how is the reader going to be introduced to some of these subjects? What's their, what's, what are they thinking basically? And you have to think of that also in terms of the introductions for these sidebars, like 
if they don't know what the if they're not necessarily interested in the costumer like what titles are they going to be interested in and sometimes you can see like our personalities coming through right. in the things we emphasize like um for example when we talk about some of the spanish uh productions or people the collaborators that they have if you look at some of the titles of the works that they come in it's like these are some of my favorite films that they worked on right. combined with some of their most famous stuff so it's it's a bit of give and take but to directly address your question i think the structure of it was wasn't consciously that kind of labyrinthian kind of structure that you mentioned but it's really it happens like that you, it things take shape as you as you start to think of it so i wouldn't be surprised if it kind of organically took mm -hmm. some kind of resemblance to the the structure of the the film because we may not have intended it but it's it's probably there <laughs> So you said the um, the idea for the book came from them first. You didn't pitch it. No, I mean I. This is one of my favorite movies, and right. I put it on my top ten list the year that it came out, and that's that's why they came to me. Okay. Because of that, like they knew that I was this guy who wouldn't shut up about the devil's backbone. Right. Because because I was going to sort of ask why this movie. Why this movie? Well, that's why. That's why yeah. they were like you know. Uh, um, you know who can we find who could talk about this movie for the length of an entire book and not get bored with it and, and want, to, want to run away and hide and the answer is call that yeah so yeah but you know i'm sort of known for that i'm sort of known for like grabbing onto a particular tv show or movie like a dog with a bone and never letting it go ever you know like i'm still talking i just this morning i was recommending that people watch terrence malick's the new world which is one of my favorite films of all time and it's like wow i've been I've been on that hobby horse for 12 years now. It's kind of amazing. I will say The New World is a great movie. However, it is a terrible date film. I can't recommend <laughs> it in that regard. That one specific context, don't do it. Why is it a terrible date film? Long story short, differences of opinion. <laughs> right. That's all I'll say. Yes, light and harmless is the best kind of date film. Yeah, yes. Not profound cosmological questions, perhaps. You talked about the composition of the shots in your interview with Guillermo. Did you talk about like the transitions, like the ones that come to mind are like the um, the chicken clucking and then the hammering, and like yeah. the water. There's a lot of transitions with water. Yeah, we did talk. We do talk about that a little bit, and we and he's a very metaphorically minded person, and 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 his approach to metaphor is very simple, and um, it's sort of like graphically driven like he looks at similarities and shapes of things and textures of things but in this movie remember this was his third film and he had made a a wonderful little vampire movie called Kronos in which came out in 19 I think it was officially released in 93 although it didn't make it to the US until a little bit after and then he did this movie called Mimic <laughs> with Harvey Weinstein at Miramax and that was so traumatizing, that entire experience was so traumatizing to him that he wanted to never make, never direct another movie again. Which is very sad when you think of it, considering that was only his second film. And then Pedro Almodovar came to him, who had loved Kronos, and told him right after the release of that movie, if you ever want to do another film, call me, I'd love to produce it. And he called Guillermo and said, hey, are you ever going to take me up on my offer to produce your next film? And he said, I, I'm never directing again. I, I hate it. I don't want to go anywhere near a film set ever again. And, and then after a while, he talked himself into it and he made this. But it was a low-budget movie. Like It looks like a big movie, but it's a very low-budget movie and it was shot very quickly. And I was surprised by that. I had no idea that this movie was, was comparatively not that much more expensive than his first film. Uh, and everything was shot in a hurry. And in some cases, there are these incredibly elaborate set pieces that most people would prefer to spend two or three days on. And he had like an afternoon to do it. And somehow he pulled it off. So I'm telling you all that to say that um, this movie was heavily, heavily storyboarded so that they weren't shooting anything that they didn't know for a fact they were going to use. And when the time came to edit it, they're not, in most cases, they're not deciding between seven or eight available shots to edit together to make a scene. They only shot three shots for the scene, and they string them together, and that's the scene. And that's a very old-school way of directing. Like, increasingly, people don't like to make movies that way. Uh, I think in part because um, movies and uh, 
big big like fantasy movies genre films adventure films things like that are increasingly driven by producers and studios and they like to have a lot of options so if a director cuts a, mo a scene together a particular way and the producer doesn't like it they don't want to go to them and say do you have any other shots so that we can re-edit this and the director says sorry no that's the that's the only shots i got they want to have like you know 10 12 15 other shots that they can do and in fact like the marvel films the dc films probably the star wars movies all insist on that um and maybe they're maybe it's not unwise for them to considering that the last two directors of star wars films have been fired and replaced by other people so i i think it's really interesting though because while some of the stuff is storyboarded um it is as Matt, as as you explained it is partly the emphasis, it kind of uh, is almost like a, there's like a, a subconscious thing that you'll see. You'll see recurring images in this film that I don't know if Guillermo realizes that are pet ideas of his. Like, for example, the erection of the crucifix in, uh, the, uh, in the Devil's Backbone mirrors a couple of scenes, one in Mimic, uh, one in Kronos, uh, this fixation with... Uh, you know the burden of ritual, things like that, uh, or the slugs in the film, the the chickens. Like we have an entire section on insects that we ended up not using in the book because we were going to bust the page count. But like we spent probably an hour and a half just talking about his obsession with insects, which is you know really really a big part of his life. Yeah, and like even in his new movie, Shape of Water, like you'll see, it was really interesting because like the creature design for that, he was consciously trying not. To repeat himself so the monster in that is like fish and uh all these different things that are basically trying to not be what he's done before yeah. it's not going to be like abe sapien or the gill man it's going to be uh and it, it, he winds up still repeating himself right. which is always it's, it's funny to me because he's like oh well that's not the gill man monster that's actually like a fish it's like it looks like the gill man dude it does, but it's like sexy Gilman. It's it's it is it's sex sexy Gilman. And he's got as other people have commented, the ass on that Gilman is unreal. <laughs> well, it's no, unreal. He, he's like he went to like Gil, the Gilman like gym. I that, think that's what's incredible because the design for that was, as you said, it's 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 down to the minutia. Like he he's joked about how like there is a very precise shoulder to butt ratio <laughs> on that monster, and that is not yeah. accidental. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's Gene Kelly's butt that they yes. gave to the uh, to the Gilman. They had a cast drawn. It was yeah, <laughs> very elaborate. Yes. Um, so Matt, I saw at the end of the book here you say that this is your favorite of your most films. Yeah. And but so that just begs the question to both of you. Subsequently, after Devil's Backbone, he's made lots of uh, projects. So yeah. how do you feel, each of you, that he's developed um, or regressed as a filmmaker? I think it's interesting because in this interview he says, you know, I said this is my favorite of your m movies, and he said mine too. But now, now he's telling everybody he's changed his mind, and now Shape of Water is the favorite, his favorite thing that he's ever done. And I think it's because I don't think it's I, I don't think that's a better movie. I think it's different. I think it's a different movie. But I think Guillermo is just saying that because this is the movie that's probably going to get him a a best director, at least a best screenplay Oscar, which I think is a completely valid reason to say that it's your favorite. Right. You know, like I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with that at all. <laughs> well, I think um, Devil's Backbone is still my favorite. I like Pan's Labyrinth, but I feel like it addresses some of the same issues as Devil Back Devil's Backbone, but it, it maybe overcomplicates them a bit. Um, I loved Crimson Peak. Loved Crimson Peak. That was one of my favorites, and I loved um, Pacific Rim. I gave four stars to Pacific Rim, and I'd do it again. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Someone's gonna stop you. Well, ten, well, you know, ten-year-old me would have seen that movie fifty times, but almost fifty-year-old me could have had to settle for like ten. I, for for me, I think in a lot of ways, there's because Guillermo is not just a director now; he's like a producer. He is, you know, a patron of other artists. He, he does a lot, and I think in that sense, um, one of the reasons why I think Shape of Water is probably his favorite right now is because it feels like the er Guillermo del Toro film. It's the right. ultimate right. Guillermo. It, like it, pull, it feels like he's kind of summing things up, and there's like a kind of creative frustration that led to this great release, and it feels, it feels like a very like a statement, but one of the things that I, I, my favorite of his post Devil's Backbone films is a movie where he pulls together a lot of those same elements, but it's done in a much more 
unconscious way. And that for me is Hellboy. Hellboy yeah. for me, the first the Hellboy. First, the first one. Not yeah, the second. second one feels like he's trying to, it's, it's a little too self-conscious for me. Mm -hmm. It's very strong, but it's the first one, I feel like he got the keys to a, a new kind of playground. Mm -hmm. I, this metaphor is terrible. But anyway, he, he, he had the ability to do a some private playground. Yeah, a private playground. Not and a public he, one. Not a public. And it, basically, he, he had a freedom, and I think he knew exactly what he wanted to do. He was able to improvise in ways that I don't know if he... I think since then, he has done similar things, but I think there's a freedom and a, a sense of uh, uh, kinship to the, to, the, to the characters in the project that seems almost effortless in that film, whereas in the projects after that, it's a little hit or miss for me. Like I, I kind of like Pacific Rim. I kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Pan's Labyrinth, which I think is maybe his best mm -hmm. since uh, uh, The Devil's Backbone. But for me, my favorite, one of my favorite since that, is has to be Hellboy. I also like Blade too, because of, that of the melodrama, like the vampire father son melodrama. It's really like intense. Sign a book or uh, hang out. So, thanks. Okay.